Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young, here to go over what Chris Kleiman had to say at his first press conference of 2024. It is here. It unofficially kicks off the season as K-State is a few days into their fall camp now, kind of getting everything figured out, and uh, we'll get to hear from the head man himself in just a little bit. But before we do, a reminder that the Cats are headed to Dublin, Ireland next August for the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Join your Wildcats by booking your getaway at cats2ireland.com. The best seats and hotels will go fast, so secure your package now. That's cats2ireland.com to make sure that you, your family, whoever you want to take with you, is able to go watch K-State and Iowa State a little Farmageddon in Ireland next year. Uh, because if you want to just knock out the planning right now, make sure you have it locked in. Go to catstoireland.com so you can be there in attendance for the Aer Lingus College Football Classic, and uh, that's the best way to make sure you see K-State. Now, one thing that Chris Kleiman was not doing, he was not talking about 2025 football today. He was talking about 2024, and I guess let's uh, start by looking at a couple of things that he discussed. And these I didn't I didn't take any of the clips for because I don't necessarily think that they were worthy of longer extended moments, but maybe some things to to take note of. The first one that came up for me was when he was talking about defensive tackle. He did not mention Malcolm Alcorn Crowder's name. Are, are you surprised by that at all that, you know, this somewhat highly sought after Juco defensive tackle that we thought might be integral to K-State's depth at that position this year was not b- brought up when discussing defensive tackles? I understand why people might be, but personally I was not. And I thought that some people probably were probably making too much of him. I think missing spring ball really impacts how much of a difference that he can make this year personally. Um, now m- maybe he can make a lot of progress in fall camp and, and I'll be an idiot, or maybe he can make some progress in the first half of the season and can, you know, at least be a contributor in the second half. But I think anything that you can get from Alcorn Crowder this year is probably, probably should be viewed as a bonus. Um, that's just me personally. Um, and I think today's Chris Clement press conference probably reinforces that notion. All right. The other thing that kind of became clear today is the offensive line is roughly starting to take shape. And I know that you drew and I, we talked about this kind of over the weekend, like what do we think the offensive line ends up looking like? The first thing that was mentioned, it makes it pretty clear that as of right now, Sam Hecht is the leader at center. That should be the expectation thrown in the, in there. Andrew Langang is going to claim one of the guard spots. Chris Kleiman said that they've, you know, put him around left, right. He can also play tackle if they need him to. Uh, and then in addition to that, it seemed like, and another thing that we kind of assumed was that Carver Willis probably has a lock on that right tackle spot, but he was asked about left tackle, which is, you know, most of the time, the most important uh, position on the field in terms of the offensive line. Unless you had a left-handed quarterback, then you'd probably be talking about the right tackle. Uh, here's what Chris Kleiman said ha- had to say about the left tackle battle at K-State that involves a returner and a transfer in Easton Kilty. Um, I think we're going to see both guys play right now between Kilty and Pastore. Um, they both need to play uh, an awful lot if it were – we're playing tomorrow. We'd, it'd probably be a 50-50 deal. Let's see where it plays out. Let's see the health of both guys um, as we move forward. Uh, but uh, I, I'm excited because we have that third tackle right now with one of those guys opposite of Carver as well as uh, Liney that could play a tackle or could spell uh, anybody inside because we could move Bubs inside the center if we had to and keep lining at guard. We, we've got a lot of different combinations. Um, and, and, and we've talked at length about this, Coach Riley and I have, um, about making sure that we – and it will help having, having Drew Little be on the sideline and Riles being upstairs, uh, of Drew being able to help us with some substitutions so that we get more guys in at O-line. All right, so what is your takeaway and thoughts on how the offensive line is shaping up where if you're reading into it today, it would seem Carver Willis at right tackle, 
Hadley Panzer will have one of the guard spots. The other would probably be Andrew Line Gang, Sam Hectic Center, and then left tackle up in the air. And maybe that all gets shifted if you feel like you need to use Line Gang or Willis at left tackle. Yeah. I, what I would say is what we have seen in practice, both in the spring and then last week at day two of training camp, would not suggest that there's that much of a tussle at left tackle. I don't know about you, but I feel like the only left tackle we've really seen run with the ones. Now, maybe it's a small sample size when comparatively looking at and considering how much they practice, but the only one we've seen with the ones is Easton Kelty. Uh, I don't think we've ever seen John, John Pastore run with the ones. And I did take his comments a little bit differently. I agree. He seemed to very much, you know, in, in I guess, infer that Carver Wills is definitely the right tackle. Liam Hecht is definitely the center. And Hadley Panzer is definitely the right guard. But I kind of read between the lines. It sounded to me like, because I think at one point he said something about Andrew Line Gang spelling the guys at guard. So it, it almost sounds like Taylor Porty might still be running with the ones at left guard. Yeah, and here is a little more on offensive line talk in the development that's gone on there from Chris Kleiman earlier today. Well, Sam Hex probably got the most important one. They're all important, but the fact that he's the center, he's touching the ball every play and um, had a really good summer, and I think he's off to a really good start. It helps when you've got uh, um, TP and, and uh, Hadley next to him and, and Carver outside, but uh, uh, some of those guys are, are coming along, and, and we're continuing to develop some depth there as well. So that right there goes to what you're talking about. Where he says TP to the side of him where Taylor Poitier might still be that guy there. And there was a point later on where Chris Kleiman did make it clear they want to rotate offensive linemen more this yeah. year, it seems. Andrew Langing's going to play. And, and some of these start jobs probably aren't completely buttoned down yet. I mean, it's only... No, well, August August 5th. And, and they probably won't be buttoned down even if we're sitting here talking about it on September 21st or something. Yeah, especially, you know, game one, game two. You'd probably like to know. You, you'd like to solidify it and have it confirmed one way or another who you guys are going to be. I was going to say by the BYU game, first Big 12 game, but you might want it by Arizona. Yeah, that. Yeah, I think – that would probably be the goal is Arizona because they'll be a, a a tall task. A couple of other things that might be notable that that there that I didn't pull audio from Kleiman for was in addition to a lot of guys being named at offensive line, there were a lot of running backs that got shout outs today. And Chris Kleiman was kind of asked about it, said, Yeah, we want to use more. It's obvious that DJ Giddens is going to get a ton of touches and be the main guy there. It's clear that Dylan Edwards is going to be involved heavily in the offense in a lot of different ways. But then there were a handful of other guys that got mentions today. James White, Joe Jackson, uh, and Evan Cantu also had their names mentioned a couple of times. What do you make of Chris Kleiman's comments about running backs today and how that might look going into the season? Because we've kind of prepared people for it. But when Chris Kleiman first got to K-State, his style at North Dakota State was to have a, a pretty good handful of running backs that can go out and see the field for you. Like Deuce Vaughn was kind of a unicorn uh, for Chris Kleiman football teams. And then, you know, last year you really only had two clear cut guys. It feels like K State's more comfortable with working more guys in this year now. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely can be a running back by committee approach given the talent in the room. We've said for a few months now that it's a pretty loaded room. Um, everyone knows DJ Giddens, everyone knows Dylan Edwards. And uh, Edwards wasn't necessarily all that productive at Colorado. I think everyone understands that that was a pretty unique situation and would be shocked if he wasn't super productive this year at Kansas State. And then look out Joe Jackson is all I would say because we know how good DJ Giddens is and he, he had over 1,000 yards last year. And we know how explosive Dylan Edwards is. And even Chris Kleiman said he was like shot every time he gets the ball. It's like he gets shot out of a cannon, is what he, how he uh, described it. But, you know, we'll see how long it sustains. But, I mean, not long ago, I was told that, you know, one of the best players in the first few days of training camp was Joe Jackson. So that is probably the best illustration of how good this room ultimately is. Uh, does Davon Rice play? He has a chance. He's a true freshman. It's a little bit easier as a true freshman to play when you were a running back and you probably ramp up the likelihood even more when you enroll early. 
and the fact that you're also a home run hitter a little bit like Edwards, I would think Davon Rice has a shot. Chris Kleiman seemed to infer that he has a shot to at least get a touch here and there. And he also mentioned LeJanes White. And, and we'll see where, how that unfolds to a guy that's been around a lot. He's at least going to be one of their main special teams guys, I would imagine. Not not necessarily a kick or punt returner, but a guy that's a lot on a lot of the units. One other group that uh, there were multiple names mentioned today was when it came to who's going to be kicking footballs this year for K-State. Chris Tennant is is obviously the kicker there, but even Chris Kleiman said, you know, Leighton Simmering would be ready if, if we need him to take a couple of kicks because you, you, you don't want to fatigue the leg of Chris Tennant. Uh, and then punter is an up-in-the-air situation, and he mentioned either Tegan Cobb or si- Simon McClannon. Uh, what did you make uh, of just where K-State might stand on their kicking game and and overall how important is that to what k-state will do this year because drew and i talked about it like we think this will be a pretty good offense but even a good offense that k-state had last year one of the best in the big 12 they still punted it like anywhere from four to six times a game yeah i think punter is probably one that you want to hone in on a little bit more than kicker if chris Tennant continues to make the progress like he did from year one to year two then he should have a pretty solid to really good year three. And look, if this offense is kind of what I anticipate, which means it's probably more home run hitter than it is a bunch of singles like it was last year, then you might be talking about less field goal attempts in general anyways. Um, Chris Tennant will just have to hit the putts, which are his extra points. He's probably had a harder time with the extra points last year than he did the field goals. So um, something to think about, but I do think like you, you know, alluded to, I think the punter job is probably more critical in terms of importance and focus and, and for us covering it, we're probably not doing it enough. Uh, I would imagine Simon McLean's leader in the clubhouse, but it's interesting that Tegan Cobb is being mentioned. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll roll away from some of just the quick and notable things and we'll get a little bit more from Chris Kleiman here and probably one of the the first things that I saw trickle out that people were intrigued by was Chris Kleiman commenting on the size that's been added for a guy like Keenan Garber. So here is what Chris Kleiman said about his corners today. Yeah, and let's hit Keenan and Jacob because those guys are both close to 200 pounds. And that's crazy to think what what uh, those guys came in. You know, and Keenan was a wide receiver, and Jacob was a, a, a quote a smaller corner from from Olathe North, and both those two kids are pushing 200 pounds. They're plus 195 for sure, and I know they've both touched 200, and they're faster. And that's the, probably the neat thing for me is they've gotten faster as they've gotten bigger and stronger. So, uh, plus they've had tons of reps and experience. Justice James is in that boat with with Terry Kirksey and Le James White. It's slowing down so much for him that um, he played a lot of football for us last year, but he's we're more and more comfortable with him um, being right now that third guy. It is a big battle for that fourth spot, and uh, that fourth spot's going to play a lot for us as we get into some nickel and dime things um, based on personnel. So whether it's uh, uh, Jordan Dunbar, Kenigel Thomas, uh, Donovan McIntosh, there's a lot of guys there that are taking some of those reps, and um, we've got to make sure that they can take legitimate game reps to take some off of those two top guys as well as be the guy when we go to nickel and dime. How significant to you were uh, the the notes from Chris Kleiman on the size being put on for Keenan Garber and Jacob Parrish and then uh, some of the, the names that came after and what might be coming for K-State? That was the biggest moment of the presser to me, to be quite honest. Uh, just the way he lit up, how excited he got. Um, I don't think Chris Kleiman was as animated anywhere else in, during the press conference than he was while discussing Keenan Garber and Jacob Parrish. And he was also like, like you could like had some like swagger to him. He was like bragging because he's like, so he's like, you know, they're 200 pounds. And then he like paused, and like waited for a reaction. Like you saw that, right? Um, so to me, that was the moment of the press conference. I, I don't, think anything else came remotely close to it so yeah it's a big deal look i jacob Parrish is a, a smaller corner for him to get to 200 pounds that's surprising to me 
Um, and obviously we know that he can fly. We know Keenan Garber can fly. There's no way I thought he could touch 200 pounds. So the reaction by Kleiman, I think, is the most significant part of this topic. But the the content of it specifically is also pretty major. Yeah, I thought it was uh, it was notable with the the size and everything. I mean, is with the way that the Big Twelve is is set up. I mean, how important is it for the corners to have more weight and more size to them in terms of being able to handle uh, what will come their way and and what has been a, a really good receiver league for a long time? It, it just helps you in the one on one, like fifty fifty balls. It helps you. Um, you don't get manhandled off the line of scrimmage. You don't get you know, like physically assaulted, essentially, you know, in some of those situations. I thought Jacob Parrish was really good last year. He had some less than stellar moments, but it wasn't because he couldn't cover anyone. It was because he wasn't strong enough. He wasn't bulky enough. Now that he is, look out. I mean, if he really made that kind of transformation, and I'm not saying he didn't, but if that comes to fruition, I mean, he easily could become one of the best corners in the league. I remember people saying, I was crazy at one time when I said that about Julius Prince. I was like, Julius Prince is no problem covering anyone either um, because he could also be 10 feet away from someone and still have the arms and size to cover them. He didn't even have to be close to people to be able to cover them. His problem was always ball skills, right? He had he needed to find the ball in the air. If he got that down, he was one of the best corners in the Big 12, one of the best corners in college football. Guess what? He got that down, became one of the best corners in the Big 12, became one of the best corners in the country, and became a second-round NFL draft pick to the Indianapolis Colts. Not saying Jacob Parrish has a similar trajectory, but now that he's kind of, you know, addressed the one part of his game that kind of sunk him at times last year, I would look out because he is really, really good because all of his other traits are really magnificent. All right. uh, Moving on now, the linebackers were brought up to because it seemed pretty clear cut. Hey, we know who the top two linebackers are. We know that Desmond Purnell and Austin Moore, they're going to be out there. Where does everything else shake up as to number three and everything that falls in line behind that? There was also no mention of Alec Marenko was a little bit banged up uh, at one point, but here's what Chris Kleiman said on the hunt for the third linebacker. Um, Bo Palmer and uh, Austin Romaine are, are playing inside. Alec Marenko is a kid we brought in, uh, been a little bit slowed by an injury, so he's missed a little bit of time, but he'll be a part of that mix as well. Um, Asa Newsom back healthy really is good. You know, Asa's at full speed rolling around. Um, Rex Van Wy, Zach Wittenberg are doing a really good job at that Will linebacker spot. Uh, and, uh, and we've got some young guys that we're evaluating and, and looking at. But So there, uh, there's a little bit on the, the linebacker situation. How do you ultimately see the, the linebacker spot playing out once K-State gets into the season? Because I think there are probably a lot of different thoughts and opinions that K-State fans have on how they'd like to see it shake out. Uh, but but how do you anticipate that going? I mean, he's got to get healthy, but it's got to be Alec Marenko, I think. So that injury, though, sounds like minor in nature at this point. You hope it's not something that lingers, and you hope it's not a sign of things to come because he did have injury problems at New Mexico as well. I've said it you know, for the past several months, both to you guys in writing on other shows, if Alec Marenko gets right a middle linebacker is what they need, then, you know, there's, I almost have next to no concerns about this defense, <laughs> but if he isn't, you have questions about middle linebacker. Austin Roman, I think is going to be a really good player. Is that time now? Um, it wasn't last year. The fact that what he was able to do as a true freshman was impressive, but it wasn't good enough, right? Now, is it good enough now? I th- like I. If he becomes all Big 12 player at some point, it would not shock me. Is he ready now? He wasn't ready last year, but the fact that he was as good as he was, and I, I know that wasn't great, was a sign of what he can become. I'm just not sure he's there to, at this point, you'd rather have him be the number two guy. But if Alec Marenko doesn't get to where he needs to be or is banged up, then you're pushing Austin Romain back into the mix, unless what Chris Kleiman said about Terry Kirksey is real. And I'm not sure about that. He looked a little bit lighter when we watched practice last week. 
Um, I'm sure he's making progress. I don't know it's to the point where we should significantly consider him a contender for playing time. Maybe he is. Um, that would surprise me. And it would be one of the surprises of the training camp. There's already always a few. And then obviously in the outside linebacker spots, you know who you have with Austin Moore. You know who you have with Desmond Purnell. Sounds like the line, the, the backups there probably making the most headway. Sound like what Asa Newsom and Rex Van Wy. Those were the yeah. two that got mentions. Yeah. Uh, one other guy that got a specific name shout out, and this is one that probably a mix of exciting for K-State fans to hear, but also, okay, but I'll believe it when I actually see it on the field. And that was discussing Keegan Johnson, uh, the Iowa transfer receiver that played up and down a little bit last year, dealt with injuries, and Chris Kleiman made you know some, some comments say, hey, if he's healthy, this is what he can be. Keegan Johnson is a guy that we can keep him healthy. I think he's one of the best wide receivers in, in the Big 12, and uh, our, our, our staff knows that as well. He continues to improve. This is another thing that we talked about over the weekend when discussing how is receiver going to end up looking. Uh, in, in your minds, uh, you have liked Keegan Johnson at times. What do you think that this is going to be a, a spot that he actually comes through this year? Is the health going to be there and, and can he actually reach that potential, especially given the guys that are going to be competing around him? Because it feels like right now, K State has about three guys that are on the same level of if somebody steps up, the spot is yours to be. Uh, the next receiver behind Jace Brown. They also have a few guys that, if healthy, will make a huge difference on this team, but if healthy is kind of the question. Um, obviously, that's Keegan Johnson, and I agree with Chris Kleiman. If healthy, he might be the best wide receiver in the entire Big 12. He is that good, You, but he's never been healthy. He was healthy all last offseason, and then it came to games, and then he was no longer healthy. He's been healthy all offseason again. He's been one of the best players on the team. Can he sustain that for the next three or four months again? We just never know. You, you, we have those questions about Keegan Johnson. We have those questions about Alec Marenko, and he's already been banged up in training camp. And we have those questions, I think, kind of about Uso Samalo, too, and nose guard. So health is going to play a factor this year early and it's for Keegan Johnson. It's not about ability. It's all about availability. And, you know, I know what the question is, but I, I guess I don't, I don't necessarily have a crystal ball here too, to know that, that he's not going to, you know, roll an ankle or pull a hammy or, you know, injure his groins, you know, it's something like that. Cause it, it has <laughs> the weird part about it too is it hasn't been anything structural for him ever. It's never been anything bone-related to him ever. It's all soft tissue stuff. Well, and another receiver that got a mention was Dante Cephas, and they talked about playing him on the outside. I mean, we'll, we'll discuss it deeper, I'm sure, at a later point in time, but uh, anything that Chris Kleiman say today make you think that Dante Cephas is going to be I guess, higher on the depth chart than than maybe what would be anticipated right now, or just maybe give people a, a temperature check of how you feel about that position for K-State. Because I think it's just, it's Jace Brown. Everybody feels pretty good about that, but then what else could come after? Who knows? Yeah, I feel good about Jace Brown. I still feel good about Keegan Johnson. Now, the injury stuff is relevant, but we also, I think, and I guess I know it's an extension of what happened to him at Iowa, but I think we pretend that like he's been at Kansas State for three off seasons and has done nothing. It's only been it's only his second one, so I'm not going to rule him out and say he's just been like this his entire career at Kansas State when what he's been at Kansas State for maybe 18 months at this point. He hasn't been there as long as what I think some of us try to paint him out to be. Um, so I you have two of the best receivers in the Big 12, really, if, if healthy. With Keegan Johnson and Jace Brown, but Dante Cephas, not. I thought today was an extension of everything else that has been said about Dante Cephas throughout the soft season, which is nothing remotely disappointing, but nothing remotely glowing either. Which is why I think that there's a little, I you know, this is more me reading between the lines, maybe trying to see something that isn't there, 
but I I think there's a possibility that Jaden Jackson is probably maybe a nudge ahead, has nudged ahead a little bit of Dante Cephas. And that, that could be me just trying to see something that isn't there. No one's completely emphatically said that to any of us, and no one's emphatically shared that at a press conference, media availability, nothing. But I just tend to get the impression that Dante Cephas is just going to be a a solid dude that could be your third starter, could be your first off the bench. I don't, I haven't really, I guess, picked up on anything that would suggest he's anything more than that yet. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that makes sense. All right. Closing things out now. The uh, last piece that I have from Chris Kleiman is Mitch Fortner of K Man asked him about the addition of the two minute warning. Chris Kleiman talked a little bit about it. He didn't seem to be overly concerned about it. I think, I think it, that's one changed, that's just a pretty simple thing where it's like the coaches realize it's a little different, but we're going to benefit from it probably it quite a bit. Timeout strategy. That's yeah, it. yeah, yeah. And, and Chris Kleiman, I don't think at least recently, I don't know that I've had complaints with his timeout usage, so I'm not overly concerned about that. Uh, it may just be if it's anything like last season. Most of the time, you'd just be like, "Really, a two minute warning?" I mean you're kicking Baylor's ass 59 to 14. Can we just end the game? What's it's going on? Just, just make an extra coin on another commercial, right? Yeah. yeah. But what he did say was the helmet communications is interesting. And I've thought about this since going back to the bowl game against NC state, because teams last season could have used it in their bowl games if they wanted to. Now K state and NC state did not end up using it. it seemed like K state maybe had some trepidations about how that would go down. Also, they're going to be able to use the Microsoft Surface tablets on the sideline like they do in the NFL this year. Now, the one difference between the NFL and college is in college, they're going to actually be able to watch video on the sideline. I found this out at Big 12 Media Day when the the DV Sport guy and Microsoft were actually there and they were showing us the system and they were like, yeah, in the NFL, I think it's you only get like four or five pictures from a play. They don't get video on those tablets in the NFL. You will here in college. Here's what Chris Kleiman said about adjusting to the helmet communication and gave us some insight as to who will be talking to what players this year. Through five practices, man, it's the helmet communication. That's the number one thing that's out there. And I know we got um, tablets on the sideline and stuff. We, we, we're not close to being ready to um, practice that, but we're practicing Oh, Coach Wells to the quarterbacks, Coach Klanderman to the to the linebackers, and calling things out every day, and that's something that um, it, it's it's kind of learning on the run. We're visiting with a lot of NFL teams, but uh, there's been a lot of little tweaks in the in in rules this year. But uh, that's probably the biggest one for us that we can we can work on right now. All right, so uh, what do you think of the helmet communications? And then he mentioned in there. You know, Matt Wells is talking to the quarterbacks, and then Joe Klanderman's going to uh, let the linebackers know what's going on there. Any thoughts on the situation or how that might look for K State? No, it's it's hard to go in the weeds of it too because I don't know that we necessarily or have the the information of how that works. Uh, what I would say is like you better get it down right, and and I'm not saying they're behind or anything like that. But you just don't want to lose a game or or come out sloppy because you didn't pay enough attention to that detail in training camp. And I don't have like worries that that's happening. They're already practicing it, so they're they're trying to work through those kinks now, so there won't be those kinks later. And that's a good thing to be that proactive about it. Um, I thought it interesting that it's Matt Wells communicating in the in the helmet and not Connor Riley since he's the primary play caller. But at the end of the day, I'm sure Wells maybe verbiage language wise that that might be just a little bit easier for the quarterbacks. Yeah. Uh just thought it was interesting and one of those things that people maybe have forgotten or weren't even aware of was going to be in college football this year. But that's and, kind of the oh go ahead. Yeah. And and I wonder and maybe and cuz I don't understand I guess a little bit of the benefits of it or how much how beneficial it can be or or how much of a difference maker can be like is there a coaching staff out there or maybe it's can't say maybe it's someone else like does it is 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 a program going to get better because there's a certain coaching staff that is going to benefit greater from being able to see video in game 
I'd be interested in that. Yeah, um, it's, I, I doubt it would move the needle that much. But what if? Uh, yeah, it would just be interesting. Like if there's a certain coach on a certain staff that is really good at just quickly picking a part of film and just making the adjustment on the fly to really keep another team on their toes. It'll be interesting if that exists. It probably won't, but it's something that's crossed my mind. Yeah, I think it's it's going to be interesting to see how it ends up working out and how these teams adjust. And, you know, it does seem like just based off of the language and, and even the body language that Chris Kleiman's given off with the subject that K-State isn't 100% comfortable with it yet. And you know, like you said, uh, up to speed. And, and so you do wonder how much of the old way is still going to be involved in what they do until – I mean, you're, maybe you're even like two or three years down the line where, okay, the, the signals have been completely eradicated from play calling, and now it's strictly, hey, I'm giving it to you, to your to your helmet. It's going to be fun to kind of follow along with and see uh, for K-State and, and how it impacts them and how they feel about it as the season kind of progresses. Yeah, thanks, Connor Stallions. Yeah, exactly. That Really, this benefits Ohio State, I guess, or uh, – <laughs> You know, that's this is probably beneficial for them. And maybe Ryan Day won't lose to Michigan this year. We'll see. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> if Ryan Day loses to Michigan this year, should he be fired right after the game? <laughs> well, you know, it would be hilarious and very, very Ohio State to do. They lose to Michigan, win the national title, still fire him. Yeah, well, <laughs> it'd be fair. I mean, is Will Howard the most powerful man in college football? Does, does yeah. Ryan Day's job rest in Will Howard's hands? Is there one game on anyone else's schedule that matters more to them than the Michigan game matters to Ohio State? Uh, it probably not. It probably mat. At least the benefit, I guess, would be for for Ryan Day now is that game does mean less this year, where yeah. it's it like it, it's not going fans. to keep you out of the playoff anymore. But it doesn't mean less but, to the fans. It means yeah. even more, probably. Yeah, I I don't know. I I think at the end of the day, you would survive with winning a national championship and still losing that game, but you would go, what the heck is wrong with this guy? Why can he not just beat Michigan? Come on. So I don't know, kind of uh, interesting to, to think about and talk about there, but that uh, it will do it for us today. We'll, we'll discuss more about K-State college football as a whole, as the week and the month rolls on as we are 26 days away from kickoff in Manhattan for K-State and UT Martin. So, for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. If you want more on the Cats, Chris Kleiman, everything else going on, find on three, get to kstateonline.com, and we'll keep you covered in many, many different ways. We'll also be back here tomorrow, talk a little bit more about the Cats as well. So I'm Mason Voth. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Thanks for watching K-State Online.